Hi everyone, it's 548 Eastern Standard, uh, gosh, May 3rd, <coughs> excuse me, May 3rd, 2019, I'm told. Uh, boy, it is rainy where I am. Uh, I'm near the south end of Lake Michigan, and it has been raining this spring like, I, I don't, springs are rainy, but like uh i think just the amount of rain you know three days four days in a row you know this week last week uh, kind of the week before i mean it snowed last saturday uh snowed then rained and then snowed again it's been a little weird been a little weird you know and uh if i was a conspiracist <laughs> i would uh I would kind of wonder. I know I don't want things to be bad this year for the farmers and you know the issue of the farmers in this country in in America and uh other you know northern white euro countries that have kind of spawned around the world too um is that you know farmers have to be undermined and the people who are actively uh, attempting to destroy and enslave us, the whole world, you know, not just uh, uh, one particular type of people, you know, they're doing a bang-up job world round, worldwide. Um, they got to control the food. They have to control the food. <clears throat> and uh, when you consider, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, you consider uh, Russia, 1917 uh, Russia, and the Holodomor, and how they've used food uh, in the past, starve people, and, and cause uh, all kinds of civil uh, disruptions and, and violence and murder and stuff. You know, they use food, of course. So, it just, you know, sometimes the wheels get turning, but... It's no reason for anybody to get too gloomy, because there is hope. There's there's hope for the faithful. Um, I'm told that the suicide rate right now amongst uh, white men uh, is is so high that suicide has replaced drug overdoses as the highest cause of death right now, at least in the U.S. And in white men from ages 50 to to 54, it's just huge. It's just huge, you know. That's my brother's uh, generation. He's he's eight years older than me, and I'm 44. So it's tough for a lot of people. It is, and uh, I, you know, I don't I don't want to go too far down that road. But there there are there are heavy things happening. There are um, there are things on the horizon. Um, that some would have be catastrophic for others. And I, I said to my wife just the other day, I said, you know, th the only reason that a certain amount of people that we know in these base white Northern European countries, the reason there's not more panic or if panic's the wrong word, uh, angst <clears throat> is because they're ignorant to what's going on. Uh, uh, ignorant to history and the way the world w really works and what certain things mean when certain things happen. Like, for instance, the anti-Semitism le legislation that they've been pushing through. Uh... Of course, when they attack, they will do it in a multifaceted way. Uh, they will use all their resources. They will use their primetime news, their, uh, their movie and TV machine, uh, their publishers, newspapers, books. They will use their politicians. Um, 
everything they can to steer everything in, in the way they wish because they hate our God and our Messiah and thus us because the Spirit is in us so they hate us um, <clears throat> they're not gonna win though they're not gonna win and and the people the people who take the easy way out now or keep you know choose to keep their heads down and not participate um, books are being written it's it's gonna be remembered someday a right proper accurate history of all things that have happened in the realm and time of men will be published set in stone if you will permanently so why trade um, an eternity of a good name for such a small amount of time of suffering, if you will. So that wasn't the point of my video, but you'll know by the title. I'll title it appropriately. I've gotten a lot of comments from people who I respect. Um, and and others that that uh, just that I've known for a long time through the channel, and some people I haven't, that are just getting to understand what I'm doing at least with language and Bible and research of things that are specifically Bible related. Obery. So I've got a few videos from a while back when the light bulb first came on. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to try to approach this as if it was just a friend coming to me and asking me, you know, um, can you tell me a little bit of more about what you're doing with Obrey? What is it? Where are you at with it? <clears throat> what's your understanding um things like that and i don't know maybe i'll have to make a few of these videos i was going to do uh, another reading of uh, history fiction or science but but this this is important and so i i hope that it it does some good so whenever it was that i produced the the three videos um they're hiding god but but not with a globe. It was it was supposed to be somewhat similar to the whole thing. Uh, the the other video I made, Phantom Time, Phantom Israel, which was just an illustration I thought of the paradigm shift that was happening in me. Not only a paradigm shift from things I believed, like uh, like doctrinal ideas that I believed. Um, not only that that kind of shift um, but in an, un, an understanding you see I didn't have any understanding of, of who the, the people of Israel were um, I, I had the uh, the reform theology the Catholic slash Protestant idea that there was a replacement of, of Israel um, people will believe that or that and then they'll believe that the Jews uh, maybe represent the fullness of Israel as in you know 12 lost tribes kind of technically 13 because Joseph gets a double portion Jacob adopted Manasseh and, and, and Ephraim so that that's 13 um, but um, so I was getting fed understanding at that time and so those videos were, they were really kind of cracking the egg on these concepts. And 
not long after I did those three, uh, they're hiding God, not with a globe. I started doing because I I I had already been comparing languages, comparing Hebrew to sort of what they call Indo-European, and I, I am not in love with that. I am not in love with that uh, terminology, Indo-European, because of the implications of it. European, um, let's just say uh, Germanics and uh, Celtic uh, languages, which the the form of Germanics and Celtic are, are far more similar than, than one might think. Um, in fact, the form, in many ways, of even Latin uh, and Greek, even though I don't think our understanding of it today is what it once was, and what they call the Romantic languages, they're not all that far off either. Um, when you go to Greek to Russian, there's definitely a, a much broader difference between Germanics uh, and Celtics and, and Russian, but then we're getting into different branches. Um, so, I had been comparing Germanics and specifically English as we understand it because English is, is about 26% Germanic and then the rest of it is blends of um, romantic languages mostly you know it has a certain amount of Italian it has a certain amount of French um, it, it has made up contrived words um, it, it, it has sparse amount Greek it has two um, sparse amounts of, of different languages have been added to it to, in my opinion, because of who introduced English as we know it today. Um, they did that all by design. But there was enough to English, and there still is enough to English, to compare what we would call Hebrew with English. And I had also stumbled upon a web page by... A woman, I don't know if she still keeps it up or not. I tried to communicate with her for some time, but um, she wasn't easy to communicate with. I don't know what the deal is, but um, I, I don't know if she still has it up or not. It was called yeweh.org, Y-E-H-W-E-H.org. Um, some of her theories of understanding concerning how what we call Hebrew, what I call Obri, is very much like what we understand as English, in that we have a body of consonants, and we have five basic vowel sounds. Now that's the other thing that you're going to find really ubiquitous in, of course, all the language of peoples that I would call um, Nahi, or uh, Noahites. So all the descendants of Noah, which would all be of a, a similar uh, racial profile, would probably tend to have languages, even post-Babel, languages that are essentially signs of a similarity between peoples. The other peoples of the world that would be non-noatic um, tend to have languages unless they were introduced to them. Uh, tend to have languages that are extraordinarily different. So this is the again. This would be another one of the reasons why I wouldn't believe that ancient Egypt was the uh, the setting for. Uh, the Exodus, and it, their language and their culture is too far off. Mitzram was a distant, but not so distant, relative of um, Ober, who, you know, was the progenitor and what the, the language that Abram spoke of Abram. So in spending enough time looking at the, these uh, two languages, Hebrew and European, Northern European. We'll call them Germanic Celtic languages, basically. And yeah, the Scandinavian, 
uh, in there too, which is quite similar. The, so that's why I try to keep it broad with just Germanics. I, th I think that really covers all the language groups that and people groups that we're, we're looking at. So the more that I compared, the more similarities I saw as uh, an alphabet in a system with the five vowel phonetics, basic vowel phonetics. And uh, so I started testing it and reading up on it, finding out that there was only a claim in existence. And the claim was that this group of rabbis, and for anything who knows anything about rabbis, rabbis and their body of literature is absolutely antithetical to what they call the Torah, the Law and the Prophets, and especially the New Testament and our Messiah. But these people, it is said, gave a mighty gift to the world in standardizing the pronunciation of Hebrew because as they claimed Hebrew did not have any vowels for one thing so nobody would know how exactly to pronounce it and all the pronunciation would have been by tradition that was claim number one um, and then what followed from their, I think of the right word, their enslavement of that language. They enslaved the language by putting their masora on it. And uh, there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between mas and masas and masra and enslavement. Interesting that they would call it Masoretic. So they also ended up being able to change words and define words as they saw fit. Okay, that's a problem. Now when you or when I look in Strong's Concordance, and I have a list at uh, the Obrey Project website, which I brought up here. I'm on the resources page. There is the Strong's list in Obrey, and I put in there in brackets, unedited. That's because I currently have a list wherein I'm taking out incorrect words, um, improper entries, um, things that are redundant that don't belong and it of course is my uh, ultimate hope that in the end when Obrey is fully understood we won't really even need these kind of concordant listings because we'll understand roots we'll understand the glyphs themselves and how they're put together and how words are built because um, because of the nature of a, a glyph uh, language, uh, ideographic character or glyph in the language, it would allow for words to be built. You would see, you would be able to see words at various times, let's say over a course of at least 1500 years or so that the um, scriptures were written in, you would be able to see instances of words that would occur that would be very particular. You wouldn't see them anywhere else. And that sort of thing would happen if you were able to build words based on um, the glyphs themselves having inherent meaning. You would actually be able to do that some people still do it today with English, but what they typically have to do is um, they might take a an English root and add it to a pre-existing word or a suffix or prefix and do the same thing and actually come up with a new word. Something similar is happening. 
Um, but that's the reason why I'm also keeping an edited version of the, uh, the, the Strong's List in Obrey. So I'm clicking on it right now, and I want to show you something that I did here. Um, as probably most of you know, I, I'm definitely not a genius when it comes to understanding a lot of the software that there is out there, but I'm doing my best to learn it better and better so that I can do better, you know, as I go. Now, one thing I did do with this uh, Strong's Obrey words is I put uh, cross-references in, which basically are acting sort of like hyperlinks within the document. So if you wanted to go straight to Z, which is usually called Zion, I'm just right here, you know, um, you could click on it. And it'll take you to where the Z starts, which is at Strong's Entry 2061. And if you wanted to get back to the alphabet right away to go somewhere else, at the end of each list is this little word here. It says top list. And for some reason, it didn't take. <laughs> Let me just see if that's one. Now I know something I've got I've to gotta fix real quick. Uh, to make sure that that goes back to where we're supposed to. I'm going to check another one real quick while we're on here because that kind of bothers me. Oh, here we go. Yep, it was one that just got missed. So I'm at the end of K, K, shouldn't say K, K, and you hit that and it'll take you right back to the beginning. Now I know I've got to fix that at uh, the so-called U or Yod. See, I can go right there. Yeah, that was the only one where I didn't get a link on it, it says top list but most of the time you'll have it you'll go back anyways moving on so this is a really good um, tool that can be used once you get used to the alphabet I would tell anybody who is interested in getting to know how to dig in and investigate the language and what's being said start by really knowing the alphabet <clears throat> so um i did put in this this little uh <coughs> cross reference hyperlink chart uh in front of each obri representation i put the hebrew representation the first one is what they would mostly consider like a, a calligraphic block hebrew that they claim was introduced around the time of, of uh, Ezra. And, and then the next one is a modern Hebrew you'd see on like a, um, a Hebrew keyboard. Um, the next one is the key that you'll use on your individual typewriter to get that uh, letter up. And as I've told anyone, anytime you want, um, send me an email uh, at the Obrey Project and I will send you a copy of the true type font which is uh, called Obrey Beta 3. Um, I am currently working uh, on a, an open source uh, font creator that allows um, it allows for I mean just just the finest uh, professional font creation. It's really fantastic. It's called Font Force. Um, and so I'm trying to generate a, a good uh, beta 4. However, I, I didn't want to do that. And because here's the point to beta 4 is that it is intended on not only taking these glyphs, which these glyphs are a they are a they're a conglomeration of every possible glyph I was able to find throughout any of the um, reproduced um, so-called Hebrew writings, whether they be in part small scratchings on plaster or stone uh, whether they be um, embedded in artifacts 
or even just words on the page, um, on um, pieces of papyri or parchment that did not have the Nikud yet. Um, personally, I, I think the whole Hezekiah's tunnel thing under what they call Jerusalem is uh, a phony farce. I don't think that is what was done when it says that King Hezekiah brought the Gihun down uh, westward of Jerusalem. I think that was uh, actually a quite big project, which is why it was even mentioned. There were a lot of kings who did a lot of things, a lot of big projects, let me tell you. And for them to mention that project and him walling up on the west side of it is no small thing. And it never says there's a lie about it. There's a lie that says that, that they had done that. They had worked at a fever pitch to do that, to, to bring this little bubbly uh, spring on one side of the city, which already would have been walled in and protected, by the way, and, and dug a channel down to the south side of the city where they call it, they, they call it the Pool of Siloam, so that the city would have a water supply during a siege of, of, of Asher or Assyria. And when you consider how little comes out of that spring or supplies water for the Pool of Siloam, that city still probably would not have near as much water as it needed. But I'm getting crazy here. I'll digress. Remember, this is conversational. This is, this, is the, this is the trouble you'd get into if you wanted to have a conversation with me. So, um, what happened was, right after I did those light bulb videos, um, I had been listing uh, the, the Strongs so that I could um, put them into Obrey. Oh, and what I was saying is I don't want to produce the Beta 4 yet because I have gotten new sources that I wasn't aware of before too. And I want to compare the, the form of those sources that I didn't know about before. Also, part of what I'm doing is trying to retain the spearmint, uh, the, the spearmint, the spirit of these glyphs as best as possible while at the same time bringing them just slightly closer to what their expression is in Germanic languages. I'll give you an idea of what I mean by that. Uh, currently, the letter that has a G sound, like what we call G, I'm making it on the screen right now. It, it just looks in a sense uh, like uh, two lines at a 90 degree angle from one another. I won't get too much into the meaning of it as a glyph, but it carries with it the G sound, the hard G sound, uh, and I don't see a soft G sound anywhere in sight, so it would always be G, G. So what I mean by that is this. This is not far from what we consider these days as G. I know today we have capital and lowercase. They did not have this in Hebrew or Obri. But, you know, today, if we were to take this and uh, just angle it uh, ever so slightly to the right, we could put a tail on it and a bubble on it. And we have our G very easily. Uh, again, if we did the same thing, put it here, and we swooped in with our C, we have our capital G. Okay. I certainly don't want to lose the spirit of the glyph or character uh, in what I'm doing. But I do want to get it, if it's possible, not only closer to its original intent, because we have to figure out the meanings and intents and uses of these glyphs, these ideographs, idea 
graphs. So up until recently, uh, in the beta 3 font, I had been making what is called rush, <clears throat> and is pronounced as an R, very much like our capital R, because the idea was that it was representing a man's head. And I don't know that that is the case out of extensive cross-referencing of how the R letter, R or Resh, is used. I'm not sure if this representation you're looking at is more appropriate than a representation that would be more like this. So I am drawing a vertical line with a line that is, is somewhat uh, angled out to the front right, stemmed onto it, which would look very much like a lowercase r. Um, and the reason is not only what I'm understanding in the language as far as what that glyph should mean, and words it appears in, many, 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 many words it appears in, in which you can't reconcile this human head idea. Um, but there's so much more to it where an idea of something being up and over, instead of the idea of it being a head with maybe a neck and shoulder, seems more appropriate. So that would be one glyph that would probably be altered just a little bit in the beta 4. And what I'm hoping to do when I'm able to publish the beta 4 is to provide a catalog of, of everything that I have, have ever found and used um, that is representative of the language. Uh, hopefully from before the time of the Masoretes back. Um, just as a quick note, something's really interesting for those who also follow the history, fiction, or science readings I've done and the talks I've done with uh, Chip Willman, and they know where he puts, the uh, by his own calculations, the day of what would be, you know, 0 A.D., um, that is actually right around the time that they claim the Masoretes were making this uh, gift to the world language of enslaving Obery and making it Hebrew. Okay, so that's what I'm I'm doing with the uh, the upcoming beta four, and this gives you an idea of what is within the. Um, uh, the, the, the Strong's List. So, what can I tell you? I'm thinking of the best way to uh, lay it out to you as far as how I'm using it. I don't use it alone, and that's, that's the other important thing. And this has really got to be my fault for not making it more clear because this is all happening, you know, very organically, and sometimes I'm not really able to keep up. I'm, I'm working so hard to try to understand that sometimes I don't consider that I'm not, I'm not including all the factors in the equation so that you can begin to understand too the the methodology and the tools. So I put on the website on the resources page a number of tools, websites or software tools that I think are extremely helpful. One of them is eSword. So if you want to start studying and using Obri, eSword's a great tool. I put on there um, Blue Letter Bible because I use it for Strong's referencing, but there's also Bible Hub you can use for Strong's referencing. You can get various um, concordances for eSword. eSword has almost a, an unlimited amount of modules that you can add, which for me sometimes it's, it's just way too much. I end up taking off more modules than adding them, you know, kind of like trimming the fat. Um, Q Bible. 
QBible's good because one of the best things they have there is their Hebrew, um, Hebrew to King James uh, Bible. It's it's towards the bottom. It's just called like a Hebrew translation of the Bible. And what you'll get is you'll get Hebrew on the left, and then they'll have a middle column, which will be the pronunciation of all those Hebrew words. Don't pay attention to that. And then at the right, they'll give you basically King James translation, but, and here's the kicker, and this is the part I love, um, pretty much all proper nouns they have uh, put in their Hebrew. And they do have the Strong's reference numbers by all the words at the right that you can just float over. They also have a basic concordance there, too. You could just click on those words. You get a basic concordance. It's not going to be as extensive as the concordance entries that you'll get at Blue Letter Bible or Bible Hub. But I put those on because those are tools that um, anyone is going to have to get familiar with and learn how to use to a degree to get themselves kind of rolling on this, you know? So, you'll have to get used to what the alphabet is in Hebrew and in Obri. And once you, once you know the one, you know the other. It's, it's 22 letters in the case of Hebrew. It's 22 glyphs in the case of Obri. They're both similar with the the letter. They have all been assigned arbitrary names. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, and so on. Um, with Obri, what I do to try to avoid that, because those things like names, uh, they, they get in your head. They affect the way that you perceive things. Uh, all I have been doing is applying the sound that that glyph makes. A, B, G, D, E, U, Z. So when I refer to a glyph, unfortunately sometimes because I speak English I'll say A or B and I'll usually correct myself. It would be A, B, G, D. That's literally their name. Their name is their sound. And um, that's not the only language that does it. It's, uh, I guess I would think it would just, it would be natural to, to just look at it like that. Um, <clears throat> and furthermore, if what they're representing, and I am going to get to the philosophy here behind Obri and why this has to be saw out to its, its end. It must. These glyphs that make up Obri, we've only got a couple of options concerning these and, and concerning the language altogether and what we can understand about the Bible. Our options are that either the Creator, who by His might and His wisdom created the heavens, the earth, and all things in them. And if you think about the complexity of a human cell and the amazing way in which all of nature works harmoniously together to continue this very vital um, life-sustaining cycle on the earth. The brilliant complexity that I don't even think I've heard any man put in words to these things. Okay, that creator. Either that creator had enough wisdom and foresight to create for us a language which he would use in his word and preserve, and it has been preserved. 
even though they have turned those characters into what could more or should more likely be called Aramaic because that's the people we're talking about and and their that's their common language even though they've turned them into Aramaic they have to stay with the same basic form and we're able to extrapolate back to Obri. So anyways, it has been preserved. So either this all-knowing, extremely wise creator preserved in the language mechanisms, mechanisms about the individual glyphs <clears throat> or in the, the past I've called them characters or elemental ideographs, but not letters. Either he is retained in the glyphs themselves, inherent meaning, so that a group of people or anyone could not come along later on and change them or say that this language doesn't have vowels and do all of the stuff that the Masoretic has done. And look, one thing that I found that is true is you can create a system and place it on top of something else and, and find ways through just sophistry just mechanisms that man devises in, in his corrupt mind to make that system work. That's why so many systematic theologies work when it comes to applying them to the Bible. The problem is that most of them, even though they work, they have many weaknesses. And all you have to do is spend enough time chipping away at those weaknesses and they fall down. So the system of the, uh, the Masoretic and the Nikud and everything that's been spawned from it, their lexicography, now concordances, and um, all manner of translations, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. That doesn't mean it's right. It means that they have a system, they've had a long time to refine that incorrect, improper system. So, you either have, <clears throat> in the glyphs themselves, um, mechanisms to protect their integrity for all time, or we are slaves to the definitions and the lexicons, the dictionaries of these Masoretes, and we are hopelessly locked into a system of high secretive priesthood and low slavish laity. Those are the two options we have. I have found enough demonstrable instances of how much better Obri works than what we call Hebrew. Um, that if I hadn't, if I hadn't, I never would have developed the website, the tools that I have so far, or continued to to, to relentlessly talk about it, um, insert it in my understanding of the Bible, use it to correct uh, erroneous understandings of the Bible, and so on. I would have scrapped it. Uh, life is too short to be worried about um, an ego issue. You know, and especially when you're getting treated for cancer and, and it had gotten to the point that it had and and I was very much by the time the treatment started there had been side effects that had started that were causing so much pain let me tell you so much suffering um, 
you know, all of these things, ego kind of things, and, and foolish stuff that, that's just chaff, that's just dust, that's not going to last. Those things become very unimportant. And, and this never for one moment lost even uh, the, the tiniest part of its importance in general. So, I would say, okay, learn, learn the Hebrew alphabet, and you're going to learn the coinciding obri. And the coinciding obri is, is much easier, and you can learn this through the, uh, also, it's, it's going to help a lot, the obri pronunciation PDF that's on there too. Um, yeah, please do read the introduction concerning, you know, what, the whole intent. And then below it, what you'll you'll have is I've I've got a list of the glyphs and the way that they are pronounced. Now I classify these, and this is the other part of this that um, is different than what most people would understand about English or language. Period. Language. Period. And I I watch a lot of language channels, so I know what the the leading linguists where they're coming from. People who are linguists, they learn languages as those languages have been presented. Now, people who are philologists might get into a, a bit more of uh, the philosophy behind a language, but not so much. Uh, not that I've seen. It, it seems that so many people, especially academics, if they want to keep their job, they go along to get along. People that rock the boat in ways uh, in which their masters don't want that boat rocked, they find out real fast that they're treading on uh, thin ice. And most tend to take the, um, the easy way out because you know, they've gotten themselves um, financially uh, burdened with mortgages and cars and toys and a lot of times wives that are trophy wives or or wives in which they have a marriage that's a silent agreement you know um i will provide you with you know those those base uh things that you want if you provide me with the uh style of life that I want. And believe me, there's tons of marriages out there that are just a silent agreement, agreement uh, to that extent. So there's a lot of reasons why guys out there that have a lot more uh, to offer the world as far as, you know, their, their understanding of languages than I, I do aren't doing it. So I, I refer to these instead of uh, nouns and consonants as singers or walkers because of the way that they move across the page as they're written. The reason, if anybody has ever sang, is because you can hold notes during vowels and you can't during consonants. They're singers and walkers. Um, at the same time, I don't use... Uh, noun or verb, I'm going to use object or action. And there's a reason for it. These And these terminologies could shift a bit as time goes. I think that's a normal part of having to develop something, or let's just say even rediscover something, is that um, your understandings is going to change as time goes on, and you learn more, just like with everything else. Okay, I may veer a little bit. I had to pause uh, and get my son taken care of. He just woke up. Sorry. Uh, so anyways, uh, after that list of pronunciations, there will be some examples. Anybody who has read it yet, read this document yet, and paid some attention to it, will notice that I did make a change in it. Uh, and this is how things go as something like this is developing. And this is, again, this is something that I believe with all my heart and my mind 
that it has the potential to revolutionize the way that we understand the scriptures. And I say that I would I would put my hand to to heaven and and swear that that I absolutely believe beyond the shadow of a doubt. Um the one thing is I have made a change. As I've had to spend a great deal of time now in Greek and bouncing back and forth between the ideas and forms of classical Greek and Koine Greek, um, I am finding the fingerprints of what seem to be the same fingerprints I found all over Masoretic Hebrew. Uh, one thing, a uh, conclusion that I have come to now <laughs> thus far, is that the letter, uh, the Hebrew letter, when I say Hebrew, I'll refer to letter. If I say obri, I'll refer to glyph or ideograph, as an idea graph. I kind of don't like how it sounds almost like idiot, but it is an ideograph. Um, it is called a tet, and, well, th they'll, they will apply whatever pronunciation to it they want to at the time. They'll apply a hard T to it. They'll apply a TH to it. They'll do the same thing to the so-called letter Tav. This can't be so. They have to be consistent. This, of course, is one of the reasons that I believe the Septuagint, as it exists today, was actually a document that was not written at the time of Ptolemy as it is claimed by the Oristian letter and the 72 scribes and that whole mythos. But I believe that uh, Masoretic was something that had already been perpetrated and that the Septuagint was based on the Masora and all the pronunciations of the Masorite. And I'll get to that at a point, because I've been working on documents uh, that pertain to that as well. So, earlier, I had been, print, I had been applying a hard T to the so-called tet, which looks like a circle with a, an X inside of it. And I had been applying a TH, like the th sound, to the final glyph, which is called by the Masoretics Tav. Um, I have changed that simply because of how uncanny the form of Greek is in its alphabet and how much sense even the look of the glyph makes to there being a direct correlation between it, what they call a tet, and what is called in Greek a theta. Same thing with a direct correlation between what they call a tav and what the Greek typically calls tau. So that change I've made after uh, a great deal of looking and I've also been reading uh, authors that are that have worked in this same area and even though they didn't make those claims because uh, the one author in particular I've been reading when I can stomach it because of some of the interpretations that he applies to biblical text I think are horrific um, he never even suggested that, nor has he suggested a direct correlation between what the Masoretic Hebrew calls ch. They have to make a, I hate that, hocking, chet, or chet, C-H-E-T. Um, and in Hebrew, it looks very much like the, uh, what they call a he, except it has a connected stem that there is a direct correlation between that. It is what we would understand today as the letter H. It bears resemblance to the letter H. And there would be a direct correlation between that 
and what the Greeks call eta. I mean, even the capital eta looks exactly like a capital H, as does the lowercase eta look like a lowercase h. Um, now that isn't anything that has changed the form of, of obery at all, but what it is doing is enhancing an understanding, uh, perhaps creating bridges that we can use when understanding all of the transliterations used in the New Testament in Koine and all the transliterations used in the Septuagint. Uh, after that list there is, like I said, a list of uh, pronunciations. Because many times in Obri you're going to find that you're pronouncing one consonant to another and then you might have areas of vowel and then consonant. So a couple of things to keep in mind is I have found no evidence whatsoever that diphthongs should be applied to Obery. Diphthongs are applied in Greek, diphthongs are applied in English and other languages, uh, which turn a combination of two or more um, vowels into a singular sound. Um, whereas I keep them more separate, say like in the second word I listed under example words, um, if I were applying Germanics or an English understanding to this, that a and u sound would just become <clears throat> more like uh, ow, it's about. This word would probably be more like it's about. Now in the past, I had been applying diphthongs because they seem to make the most sense with all of the commonalities that I saw between um, Obery and modern Germanics, specifically English, or what portion of English is more purely Germanic. Uh, however, I have had to revert and go back to keeping all of the vowels uh, with their own integrity. Um, another one would be, I think it's uh, word number six, it's two words, al oliun. So the e and u sound would not combine together as a diphthong to create one sound, but it would have its own sound, oliun. There are going to be words in which there are no vowels at all, like the word right after that, is zara. The interesting thing about H is, most of the time with H, you'll be uh, using an ah sound, like a ah of relief, kind of. So, zara. Uh, you'll also have the next word, kudish. Now, what I try to do is never to force... Um, any sort of specific phonetic in between them. Ka, dosh. And the problem is, many of us have heard Hebrew for a long time being pronounced by practitioners of Hebrew in which they apply those Masoretic vowel points to give something like this word kadosh to make it into something like kadosh. They would say it was kadosh where it would be Kadesh. Now I do apply a small bit of a W when I pronounce the Qu. Qu. I don't call it K. If I called it K and pronounced it K, then we would have two glyphs that would have the exact same pronunciation and there are too many words that share other glyphs between the Qu and K in which it would become a bit confusing, unless you understood the context and then you could make it out. But again, if we do that, and have to do that, then we are just slipping right back into that first problem we have, if we're going to just take the Masoretics word for it.
if you get to a word like the second to the last at the end. Thub. Now, if this is, and there is also a word that exists without the oo sound in it, and if I still have, and I do, maybe I can actually get to it real fast on the Strong's unedited list, and there aren't many uh, th words. See here. Well, there is thabal, thabul, thaba. So there are words that have the thub without the u in between them. Um, if one existed by itself, well, we have here thabo. Um, if it just existed as thub with just the th and b, it would be just pronounced as quickly as possible. You would walk from the one to the other. And that's the other thing about walkers or single singers is walking is quick and deliberate. Singing is slow and melodic. So instead of the thub you would have with the last word, you'd have thub. You're just getting from the one consonant to the next. And when you have a vowel, it's going to be a singer. Um, let me see if I can find a good example. While well, we have thma'e, um, we have thme, and I'm going to try to get something a little bit uh, better. It's going to have to be a compound word. Uh, thala'im. So you're giving, in a sense, you would be giving each um, so-called vowel or singer it's same amount of time in a sense in pronunciation that you're giving the walkers the problem is because a lot of us have come to know the Masoretic and their vowel points a lot of these words are longer and they will typically have uh, inserted into them uh, fiat vowel pronunciations, or they will oftentimes turn them into our uh, typical modern consonant uh, combinations. Like if you're going to pronounce the word T R E E, you would have tree. Um, if you were to put that same word with those same uh, glyphs, four of them, in their Obri equivalent, you would have something a bit different that would have to be more tere, tere. Now, is it going to be, since this is now an hour long, and again, I wasn't trying to make any points to this or anything else. I was just trying to make something that was a monologue concerning as much as I could think of off the top of my head. About, about Obri, its form, its potential, what I currently have published anyways there's so much that's not published but th a lot of it is their big documents or big projects and uh, it's been a it's been a long time that I have as one person have been working away at some of these very big things and there have also been others who have uh, done what they can as they can um, on the resources page, you will see there is a copy, Obri Genesis, or Bershit, and it's a PDF. It also has the, uh, the, the hyperlinks to, to chapters set up. Uh, that was set up by uh, a friend who had done uh, as much work as possible in, in the time frame that uh, they were doing th this work. Uh, but in general, 
it has been a very, very big project with many facets to it. That one person uh, by themselves is definitely going to find more than challenging. So, I'm, I'm just going to conclude this with, with this. For anybody who wants to dig in and wants to start understanding this. And yeah, I didn't go into, for instance, individual meanings of the glyphs and how they should work together in their two character roots. And I will. I'll make more videos because these videos, they're going to just be, they're going to be entirely spontaneous, impromptu, and it's just going to be me talking about uh, facets of Obery as I can. And the reason it's going to be like that is I just don't have the time to make the presentation videos. Even a small presentation video, like uh, some people have out there, uh, where it's just a quick maybe three to five minute presentation video, that right there can represent many, many hours of work to make that. There, for anyone who hasn't tried to produce videos, presentation videos, there's a lot of work to it. And so I'm going to do it this way uh, as I can as we go along, and then I will really try to uh, put these all together uh, along with the fiat language videos I was making. And I'll try to actually pick back up on D the D sound, not D, it's D. <laughs> See, I constantly do that, or what's called Dalit, as soon as I can, because I had left off at that point, because in the time when I was studying through these, that one was giving me the uh, a really tough time. Uh, it's funny, because the A, B, and G, I could actually remake those videos these days with far more insight than I had before. Uh, those videos were great. I got a lot of feedback from people concerning the nature and uses of these glyphs. And this was very much the intent of the Obery project, was that I don't think I was ever meant to be an island. I don't think I was ever meant to, to do something so big as this on my own. Um, first off, far too many people might uh, have the propensity of saying it's because, you know, he's so smart and I'm not, or he's so talented, and that's not the case either. Any kind of brains that I display or talent or anything else, that did not come from me, okay? You want things that come from me, you'll get selfishness and you'll get uh, stupidity, uh, mistakes and errors and all of those uh, negative things about being a man. So this was always supposed to be something that I could offer as a bit of understanding that I've gotten and with the great hopes that the saints would, as they were moved and inspired by the Spirit would be able to take what understanding I can offer and apply their own understanding and that we could get to this place of understanding the Scripture and thus with the, with the end result being restoration. You can check the New Testament texts this is the plan, is that we're to be used for the restoration of all things. You show Jesus. He is sitting at the right hand of Yahweh the Father until the restoration of all things, until the Father has made his enemies the footstool of his feet. That hasn't happened. The secret rapture idea goes entirely against all of those concepts. And you know, the other thing that it does is it really takes away the power that we have as the anointed people in 
Well, I don't want to say in Christ because Christ means anointed. In the Old Testament, Israel is called often his anointed. It says in Romans that he was the first born of many brethren. He was the first born of many brethren. And that we would do works, so many works, because of him and because of the redemption that he has effected in us, and how we are now the Beni Eh Alayim, the sons of God. That we would perform and accomplish so much that all the libraries in the world couldn't have held it all. And I would imagine in John's days there were far more libraries that hadn't been burnt down by someone. So this is for us. It's not just for me. And uh, I'll do as much work as I can as I go. I will. Um, but, you know, things are going to happen like I just explained to you concerning the so-called Tet and Theta issue. But those things happen. That's part of growing and developing. Even, uh, you know, you can... You can look at a project or an idea or uh, a great adventure you know like uh, you'd look at a child becoming a man at the beginning of of the project or great venture uh it is just in its infancy it is a baby and it has to grow and, and learn to walk and learn to speak and and learn those more mature things that help it understand the world and the way it works and a project is very much like that too you see, and there can be many influences on that child as it grows to make it into either a great man or not such a great man. And it is my hopes that uh, everybody who will uh, come along and contribute to this will contribute to it becoming what it has the potential to become. So, uh, I will be seeing you again uh, soon with, with videos of this nature. And uh, many of them will be more specific and more detailed of certain smaller things, and then many quite general. But I am going to do everything I can to make as many videos as I can concerning the topic of Obrey, uh, Bible study and uh, how it works, how it can work, uh, how we can all use it, what I do to use it to get the uh, the answers that I have, and hopefully, you know, more people will begin to understand these things, and they will they'll apply their own methods in time and. Um, show me all kinds of things that I had no idea of, and it will be a, a fantastic thing. That's my great hope. So that's why I will be seeing you just as often as I certainly can on this topic. Okay, everyone? Take care. Yahweh bless you. Bye.